Welcome to Dolby Creator Talks. I'm Ben Guyvers. This is a show about how creatives use technology to tell their stories. And my special guests today have worked together to reimagine in Dolby Atmos, one of the greatest and most influential records of all time for one of the world's greatest artists, a record that has influenced music, fashion, and culture since its release in 1972, right through to today. That record is the landmark album, David Bowie's The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, the first Bowie studio album to be released in Dolby Atmos, and a record which in 2017 was selected for preservation in the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress, and a record Time Magazine chose as one of the 100 greatest of all time. My guests are the original co-producer of this album and many others from David Bowie, Ken Scott, and he's joined by Dolby Atmos mix engineer, Emre Ramazanoglu. Ken Scott, of course, is an absolute legend in the world of music production and engineering. And he takes us inside the studio with David and the band to explore the production of the original album and how he wanted to today create a new experience for listeners in Dolby Atmos, which also led him to the creation of new stereo mixes at the same time as well. Ken began his career as an engineer at the legendary Abbey Road Studios in London, working on Beatles records, as well as Pink Floyd and Jeff Beck records. From there, he moved on to the also legendary Trident Studios, where he was an engineer for David Bowie, working on The Man Who Sold the World and Hunky Dory, which he also co-produced, as well as co-producing with David, Aladdin Sane, Pin Ups, and of course, the record we're exploring today, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Mix engineer Emre brings his Dolby Atmos experience mixing for the likes of Brian Eno, John Hopkins, and Courtney Barnett to this great album, and shares how he and Ken explored the original multi-tracks to create a new experience mixing at Rack Studios in London. They've done some very cool things to showcase what's possible mixing classic records in Dolby Atmos. Here's David Bowie's The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars in Dolby Atmos. Enjoy. Ken, you've lived with this record from its beginnings, of course. It was uh, re originally released in June of 1972, so just over 52 years ago, and it would no, oh, don't <laughs> please, yeah, <laughs> it would really go on to change the world musically and and culturally, and we we know its impact today. But did you have a feeling at the time of this recording that there was something special happening with David and his persona that was maybe different from what you had done before with him on? Hunky Dory or going back even further with your engineering of the, the vocals on his first record, were you seeing a sort of progression and did this seem especially significant at the time? I, no, <laughs> it was, look, we, we did uh, Ziggy just a few weeks after Hunky Dory. It, Hunky Dory hadn't even been released or anything. So it, it was like almost one continual session. So the, 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 the change I didn't particularly notice. I always liken it to, as a parent, you see your kids every day and you don't notice any changes. Whereas with grandparents, you may see them every now and again and you no you notice your grandkids are getting bigger every uh, every time you see them or something. It was kind of like that. I was seeing him every day. So the changes were minuscule as we went through. So no, and as far as it becoming an iconic album, we were making a record for ourselves and having fun doing it. It's we would we would have laughed in your face if you'd said that we would be discussing this in 52 years time. Bring us a little bit into the studio world with you. I mean, you began your career at the legendary Abbey Road Studios, right? And then moved on to Trident Studios, also legendary, which is, of course, the recording studio in London where the Beatles, Elton John, Queen, Carly Simon, and of course, Mr. Bowie, to name just a few recorded. And you were very progressive, right? I mean, I believe you were using a 16 track tape machine on Ziggy, which was quite advanced for that time and bringing a lot of innovation to the, the sound and arrangements and kind of building the mix up in sections. Um, what was the in-studio process like with, with you and the band in terms of recording and tracking and, and of course, your co-producing together? One of David's many talents was the putting together of a team. He kept on doing it through his entire career. He he put together a team that could give him what he was looking for without him having to ask it. That's one of the things with with myself and the spiders. It, it, it's he didn't have to tell us what to do. We just did what we do what we did naturally, and it just all came together. And as far as the co-production thing with with David, I think when we started on Hunky Dory, it was the first time that. Uh, we'd ever done that for either of us. And it began with a certain amount of trepidation. But then as we started to do things and things were sounding good and ideas were coming together and all of that, 
it just gave us the confidence and we just carried on from there. And as I say, said, it was really making a record that we liked, that we would want to hear again. We weren't making it for a particular audience or anything like that. It's just, if we liked it, we hoped that other people would. And then in terms of the mix process, like how much involvement would David have with, with the mix side of things? Almost nothing. He, he, of the four albums that I co-produced with him, he came along to maybe two of the mixes. He got bored in the studio. It, it's when we were recording the album that uh, Woody and Trevor, the bass player and drummer, they knew they had to get their take done pretty damn quickly because David would get bored. And if, if they started to mess up and weren't getting it quickly, the first things out of his mouth would have been, OK, it's not working. Let's move on. He got bored very easily in the studio. So coming to the mixing where it's listening to the same thing time and time and time again, he wouldn't have lasted very long. And, you know, you've said a couple of times that you, you guys just went in there making the record that, that you wanted to make. It wasn't, you know, even intended to be a, a concept record, really, was it? I mean, no. It Ain't Easy was actually recorded during the Hunky Dory sessions, isn't that right? And so um, this sort of thing is coming together, but it, it wasn't mapped out to be, I think, sort of the concept record that people think it is. Absolutely. There, there's two things I'll say. Number one, the, the whole concept album thing comes from one track really starman which pulls it together in makes it the possibility of a concept album the problem was that uh starman was never one of the original tracks it was just we david came up with that and we recorded it just because rca had rejected the album saying there was no single on there so david went away a couple of days later he came back with that song and we recorded it very quickly so that that's one thing with regard to the concept the other thing is that I, I got to spend a lot of time going through outtakes and all of that kind of thing for the uh, Rock and Roll Star package that came out recently. And one of the things that I had completely forgotten, and it, it became obvious doing that, was this whole sort of gray area between Hunky Dory and Ziggy, that there are a lot of acoustic things that we recorded for Ziggy and never completed, like things like Queen Bitch, which was on... Uh, Hunky Dory, and that could have been perfect on the sort of more rock and roll side of Ziggy. So it, it really was almost like one, it could have been a double album, <laughs> especially the, the timing, the way we recorded it, and just the material, the way it came together. It would have worked as a double album just as well as two single albums. Interesting. So you mentioned Starman as the single. It's backed with Suffragette City, which is, I think, April 72 when that comes out. And that pretty much does change everything the public knows and, and kind of begins Bowie mania, if, if you will. Um, we mentioned that the album comes out in June of, of 72. And, and here we are uh, this many years later. Right. Uh, and this oh, is the yeah. first Dolby Atmos mix of a Bowie studio album. I mean, I think there had been five one mixes of Young Americans in 2007 and some SACD uh, versions of, of Ziggy Stardust. But it's so exciting to hear this album now in Dolby Atmos. And I think it's the one to start with. And so thank you, Ken, for, for sending me the Blu-ray, um, which also has all new stereo mixes on it as well. And I, I want to get into talking about that. But... Can you take us a bit into how you approached putting this together with Emre at Rack? It, it started off without Emre. Uh, I, I, when the, the whole thing of Atmos came up, my immediate reaction was, oh, great, I can do it at home, the whole thing, and then just get it, piece it all together. Then I can go into a studio and maybe one or two days finish it off. Well, very quickly I learned that at 75 year, years of age, I would not be able to <laughs> – to grasp half of what's needed for a good Atmos mix. So one of the things that I knew I wanted to do was make it different from the original. Uh, it, it's it's supposedly the, the start of glam rock, that between Ziggy and uh, Mark Bolan, that started the whole glam rock thing, or they started the whole glam rock thing. And uh, one of the main things with the glam rocks sound as far as i'm concerned it's the very very dead drum sound and to pull it away from that the, the glam rock sound was fine for the 70s we're now in the 2020s it needs to be modernized so i went in and i put uh samples along with all of woody's drums and eventually cymbals as well uh which was painstaking i also went into abbey road number two to record uh 
room sounds on various things, thinking of what Atmos will be. I wanted it to be that someone was actually in the room. I didn't want it a gimmicky record. I wanted it that it's someone in the theater, in the club, in the room where the band's playing, more of that kind of thing. So I needed room sounds. So I went into Abbey Road, recorded room sounds. Then the whole project got scrapped. It was dropped for a while. Then suddenly, uh, the beginning of this year, yeah, I think it was the beginning of this year, I get a phone call saying, oh, Dolby Atmos is on again. We want to do it, but it's got to be done really quickly. So I, I had met uh, Emre at a, 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 an awards dinner, and we'd spoken about uh, Atmos because the, the, the dinner was around about the time I was considering initially doing it. And he and I seemed to think alike about Atmos. And so I asked a friend of mine, can you put me in touch with, with Emre? Put me in touch. We met up. We talked more. And it was, it was a pairing made in heaven as far as I'm concerned. I, I, during my 60 years working in studios, I hated working with other engineers because that was my background. And as a producer, I find that I can concentrate on the music more if I'm doing the engineering because I don't have to think about it. Whereas if I'm using another engineer, I'm thinking about the sound all the time and don't get into the music. Working with Emre, it was fine. It was it was music all the way, and and it, we were thinking along the same lines all the time. One of us would turn to the other and say, "You know what? We should." And then the other person would say, "Lift up the vocal by half dB." You got it right. We were answering each other, just finishing each other's sentences at times. It was perfect. Wow, that's wonderful. So Emre, take us into um, Rack Studio 4 there, which is, I think, a 916 Genelec room and, and getting that, that call from Ken or, or meeting him at that awards banquet and uh, where you guys would go together to start to unpack Ziggy Stardust must have been pretty exciting. Yeah, well, I didn't think it was happening. We had a great chat um, at the ceremony. That was really, it was really interesting. And I didn't, I don't think you ever mentioned which album it was. It wasn't particularly hard to work out, but it it was i wasn't quite sure but then it was months later wasn't it and it was like can you go in i mean was it the week after we talked i think it was something like that or two weeks after it was really it was really rapid but it was i think 11 days to do the full album from tape uh i don't know because kind of prepped a load of stuff so it was from multi-track in tools and new stereo mixes which is that's I find that that's a challenging time frame, which is what we sort of said on our first day. <laughs> yeah, there's such a nice. It was, work e- it was easy. It was it really, was easy. Really fun. <laughs> we finished early, and then went back and went over. It was really nice. It was a really nice, sort of synchronous kind of approach to all. It was great, but yeah, the sample laying was one thing that really surprised me because I couldn't tell really at all, especially the hats, which is brilliant. One of the first things I said to Emery, knowing that he was a drummer, I said, look, I put samples in there with everything. Quite often putting the samples in can make it sound inconsistent, make it sound robotic, not human. And I said, look, if you hear anything that throws it off of being natural, let me know and I'll, I'll change it. He didn't say it once. Either he's gone deaf through doing <laughs> it or... Uh, it this is always a definite possibility. But yeah, but it was the tracking was just so good. That's what made it possible because we, the mix was there when we pressed go. And then we just had to deal with uh, the new rooms, which is really interesting because we had an array of mics from Abbey Road. And they kind of, what, are, what were they, uh, 47s and 67s? 47, yeah, 47, 67s and C12s. Yeah. And we also it was Abbey Road. Yeah. Look, they, they have great mics. Yeah. You've got to use them. Yeah. And then we had a core Octo mic in the middle which I'd never heard of, but I, I managed to decode it, which is a second order ambisonic. So we managed to make that 7.1, I think, pretty much. And um, then use the canopy mics from the Abbey Road array. And that was just suddenly we were like, oh, there's no, there's no question. That's, that sounds like it's part of the sound. And that just meant, you, it's not like a big room sound. It's not like hearing Studio 2 opened out or anything or really, really long decayed. It's just a sense of space and mesh around everything. And if we didn't have something recorded, we managed to use Altiverb 8, um, which those guys have done an amazing job on, uh, to match up the rooms for the missing channels if we didn't have something or we'd used it more on one track than we expected or something. It was really, really good to 
to do that. And when when you hear them all in situ, it just feels like there's some cohesion rather than it's in a big room or anything. Well, it turned out fabulously in the mix. I mean, you would never know that there were any samples uh, put in into that at all. I mean, as I was getting into listening to it, um, I just noticed, you know, how theatrical and wide it is in some places. And in, in some cases, it, you feel like you're like right in the room. But one of the things that blew me away, it, maybe it shouldn't have, because I know how amazing his voice sounds on on record, but was just the way his voice shines on these mixes. I mean, like first and foremost, wow, like with with five years and yeah, it immediately is like a little bit wider and clearer, but his voice is so beautiful and you can feel the emotion in it. That, that was something that was very important to me with, with the new mix. Uh, I give talks all over and I, I, I close my talks with uh, about a 15 minute that I call Ken's bitch session. And it's about my dislikes of modern recording. And I close that, that whole thing with uh, uh, the ending of five years. And what I've done, I use the original stereo mix. I fade out everything except the acoustic guitar and David's vocal uh, so that the audience can hear his, his, his vocal on that, the end of that track. He was bawling his eyes out. Tears were pouring down his face. And I had to make sure that that came through a bit more than it, it did in the original stereo mix. That was the first track we did, actually, wasn't it? Five years. I believe so, yeah. yeah. And that's where we sort of worked out the floating position, of, which kept I yeah. think all the tracks bar one maybe have that sort of floating, slightly high, sort of central. And then the acoustic guitar, depending if you played it or not, would either be in front or if it wasn't, if it was Rondo playing it, it would be somewhere else. Because Ken knew we could make it right. There's not loads of movement at all in this record, really. There's moments, and they're quite extreme when they happen, but they're not. They're there for sort of a reason, but there's not much other movement going on. They're sort of placing things according to where it still sounds like a record. You know? And that's, that's what we do. I think one of the interesting, interesting things is, is it's a 9.1.4 room, but I went back to 7.1.4 for this mix, and that's just a preference. Um, I, yeah, I tend to feel more comfortable with that and hearing it everywhere. I'm more comfortable with that after I've heard this in quite a few rooms now. And that's interesting to me. But that's just room dependent. And Rack is extremely good. That really is. I mean, I think it's probably the best room we've got. It's outrageous. Um, those speakers are really, really good for localization. And the sweet spot's very small in the room, but it's, it's great, you know. So that works. That worked very well for this. We want to be quite precise about where things were. I, I have to admit that uh, some time before this this actually came about, uh, I was very unsure about Atmos and Atmos mixes, especially going back to classics, if you like, uh, the old records. Because doing mate track, 16 track, how the hell are you going to make a decent Atmos mix out of a 16 track? That's ridiculous. Until I happened to be doing a masterclass at Abbey Road and they'd recently finished and opened their brand new sort of film dubbing suite that had the, what is it? I think it's 70 speakers or something like that, and whatever the Atmos system is they've got in there. And I asked if the students could, could go and see it. And I went with them and I asked if I could hear something. And of course, what they played was one of, I believe it was one of the first Dolby uh, show tunes. And it was Rocket Man that Greg Penny did. And that was, I did the original track. So suddenly hearing one of my tracks in Atmos, which was 16 track, I was absolutely blown away by it. It was amazing. So suddenly it was, hmm, maybe there is something interesting about Atmos in 16 tracks. So I became interested at that point. But up to then, it had been a, oh, come on, it's just ridiculous. It's another gimmick. That mix is incredible, the Rocket Man mix. And it's one that, that we use kind of as a reference track for Atmos um, as we do right. room calibrations and, and even demonstrations as well. It's just, it's, it's gorgeous. Well, I think that's, that's one of the things, one of my approaches coming into this was the, the whole thing about if, if you're going to ask people to listen to a record in a different format, you need to give it to them totally in that format, not just take the stereo and just put things in different places. That doesn't show Atmos off to its fullest in any way, shape or form. 
you got to it should be something different so that they're they become interested in it again and they feel a part of it and that that was one of the things that that we we worked on and and tried to get together and i i think it worked because woody the the drummer he heard some of it and his first words were i felt as if i was there with the band now he didn't mean it as a joke kind of thing he meant he felt as if he was on stage kind of thing because it, it surrounded him so much it was perfect which is kind of exactly what we were aiming for wow beautiful so as we move a little bit into the record i mean it sounds like with soul love and, and moon age daydream it's really like okay wow this this record's coming alive now like with soul love the claps are sort of echoing on the sides and and in the rears and the, the harmonies and the background vocals really kind of come alive and um i noticed mixed guitar and the pre-chorus kind of really finds its own space and kind of like cuts through a bit and sort of sounds like the trumpet has its own space or whatever that that horn is but that that sounded just incredible yeah i mean that's that's a feature sort of um, by nature of the tracking really in that it was friendly to move around it wasn't like this is it didn't sort of fall apart which you can get very dry records which fall apart quite quickly um but this had the extra rooms kind of sort of masterminded and then just the way it was tracked like i say we've said this quite a few times but we use one compressor on one channel on one song on the whole record so that was it <laughs> and it, t it tickled it there's one r127 on one th i don't know what it was but we only i do remember only using one and that's not normally what will happen when i'm trying to glue things together and make things work so yeah it, it was it was interesting it was also an interesting record because it was going to be mastered, which I've never had before, because I do the mastering before I start the mix. That's just my workflow. So I'm null with the master before I even start in stereo. Um, so that was really unusual. And it was John Weber, who's an extremely good and a really, really nice guy. And he came down, and that was great, because he came and sat there and listened to several tracks. I went, right, I get it. And the 2.0 mixes are the fold down. And we'll make a new tool session and then it was something like we'd take down the vocal half a db or a db or put it up maybe but that would be it it just folded down so that's one of the best things for atmos for me is to fold down the possibilities with headphones you know which are improving and the potential is there for it to be incredible and yeah it's really exciting and even with i mean i don't know where this will come i, I don't know actually with this kind of record as well which isn't like vast number of elements when you go to a raise and you go to the cinematic experience it, that's a different thing but um we've had we've had success with that as well haven't we playing back in a larger with, through the raise and it, there's enough coverage in this record that it, it it works so that was really pleasing i wanted to ask about a couple of the other creative decisions but first you know while you're talking about creating the new stereo mixes maybe you know ken you can share a little bit about what inspired you to to go ahead and do that? I know you said you wanted to do something new and different with the Atmos mixes, but um, did you intend to create new stereo mixes from the start, or was that sort of a byproduct of you know what you had been working with in Atmos? It was it was essential. Uh, that was one of my demands to the record company up front that I need to do a stereo as well because uh, I apparently Apple have to have the stereo mix matched up exactly to the uh, Amos mix. Well, that's fine if you're working totally in the digital domain. We weren't. These, all of this was recorded on tape, and no tape machine in the world runs at the same speed every time. It, it varies. There's wow and flutter. There, it, just everything changes. So trying to match up a stereo to the multi-track this late on, the only way to do it is to use something like Elastic Audio or, or one of those programs and then you start to lose quality. So the, the only way for me to do it so that you, you still have the quality is to do the Atmos and take the stereo from that. And they match up perfectly, exactly what Apple wanted. And you're going to probably have higher fidelity um, results from deriving from that Atmos mix to start with as well. Well, the, the stereo mix holds together as uh, perfectly on its own. It, 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 it's very strange. I, uh, there is something about it that I was initially very worried that people that know the album really well, fans and everyone, are going to object to the, the, the minor changes that I made. 
but th that hasn't been there at all. In fact, my wife, uh, when when I came home after the mixing, I said, "Do you want to hear the new stereo mix?" Because I could I can't play Atmos at home at the moment. And uh, she said, "No, I love the original. I don't need another stereo mix. Forget it." Okay, fine. Then one day in the car, uh, the it, it, one of the tracks happened to come up, the new mix of it. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'll take it. She said, no, it's started now, let me listen to it. And it took about two and a half tracks, and suddenly it was, you know what, this is really good. It's different, but it's the same album, but I, it's different, I don't understand it. How is it better? It, it's one of those, everyone hears it, it's, it's different, but I don't know how, and it's good. One of the, uh, songs on the record that really stood out to me in, in Atmos, and they're all fantastic. Don't get me wrong, but Moon Age Daydream in particular, like, seems to open up like a little bit more. Like the the ooh choruses sort of wrap around you. But I noticed there was some movement in this one. Like the drum fills coming out of the chorus sort of pan right to left and and back across the front, which was really cool. I mean, I wasn't expecting that at all. It was it was r really interesting. I don't remember us doing that specifically. Now, the, the way I now right, okay, <laughs> the, the the way I always used to do it for uh, recording for the the stereo was that the toms would it would be high toms on the right going to the low tom on the left. So it may be something that what you're hearing is something from the original stereo, but I don't, yeah, I don't remember us specifically doing something like that. Also on that song, the or on Moon Age Daydream, the orchestral parts are so beautifully clear. You know, uh, how was that originally recorded, uh, Ken? It would have been, uh, let's see, Neumann U67s on the violins, violas, and uh, it would probably have been AKG C12As on, on the jelly. And it just set them up in the studio. One, one of the, the bizarre things when, when we go back and mix something like this, I first heard it when I did the 5.1 because I'd completely forgotten about it. But... Back then, the orchestra, or at least the, the string players, refused to wear headphones. So we had to pump everything through big speakers. And obviously, if it's loud enough for them to hear, to play to, then it's going to be picked up on the mics. So you bring up the string tracks. And there's, you also hear the rhythm section coming through quite a bit as well. And so it, it's, it's, it's always a question of sort of blending in. So you... you that it's always going to be there. You can't get rid of it. Well, I suppose with AI these days, you could get rid of it. But I think it kind of helped us. I think. Uh, I think it helped. Yeah, quite possibly. It's quite loud. Remember when I said, "Oh, I don't remember it being there at all." And then we listened when we were prepping those that work. Yeah, materials. Wow, it's really oh, yeah. loud. But it just sits in there. I thought the delays too, like on on the freak out far out moment where he's saying that they're kind of like yeah. echoing into the rears and kind of like building up. And, um, that that's one of the things that I copied from the stereo original stereo, because it, it's, it's there. And that was one of the prep things that I did made sure it was all exactly each repeat was a separate track. It, when we came to mix it, uh, just to make sure it was in exactly the right place. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. There were, there were a few different little, Annotations weren't there after we'd finished. There were little bits of spill or some counting, and we flew in a few bits that weren't on the multi track or we'd cleaned up or something. I remember that. Do you, do you remember that, Ken? There's a few, there's a few little moments which we put back in. Yeah, one of the tracks we'd got rid of the uh, counting, yeah, and it, it, it does open up with a very quiet counting on the, the record, so we had to put it back. That was quite, quite interesting when we made, we did a little immersive atmosphere for for a multi-speaker inst installation thing and we just can can send me all the beginnings and ends of all the tracks and there was a lot of stuff there that was really interesting how we talked to the band and you sort of hear the impatience <laughs> the, the perfectionism the impatience and the uh the artistry coming out it's just excited out. it's really um, excited it sounds to me I, I wouldn't say perfectionism I don't, I don't think he was a perfectionist, much like Lennon. And I think that's why they, they got on quite well. The, number one, the impatience in the studio of just getting bored. But there's also that thing of it doesn't have to be perfect to, to work. It just needs to feel right. And that was the thing with, with David, of, of the four albums that I did with him. 
between 90 95% of the vocals were one take, the first take from beginning to end. He would just sing it the once. That's it. And they're not perfect. They, they, taking it, there is no such thing as perfection, but there, there are places they're not quite in tune or they're slightly out of time, but they feel right. They feel amazing. And that's what counts far more than trying to achieve perfection. The vocal delivery on on Starman and Ziggy too, like uh, in Atmos, I mean, they're just, the, it's so clear, you know, and it's so direct, like on, on Starman, the vocal is so like beautiful and clear, like right in the center there. And it just like, it, it it's striking. You know, just to hear it that 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 clear, um, and then you know you go into a song like "It Ain't Easy," which was the first song recorded for the original album, right? It sort of had its has its own sound on the record amongst the others. It's it's kind of a unique timber to it. Yeah, because yeah, that that was recorded during the, the Hunky Dory session, so there's going to be slight different sound quality to it. And then, you know, like going into like Suffragette City, I mean, the vocal harmonies and, and the big vocals are just so present. It just seems to really lend itself well to the Atmos environment. So um, you shared a little bit about the reaction that, that Woody had to, to hearing it. Can you share a little bit more about any of the approval sessions or sort of um, sharing with the, the Bowie estate any, any reactions that they had? They loved it. That, that, is, that was what I was worried about. There was one particular person, uh, and he, he, he worked for the record company, retired from the record company, now works for the uh, Bowie Estate, and uh, Nigel Reeve. He, he knows everything about uh, David's recordings uh, and a, a total fan. And... I was very worried the day he was coming down. He was coming down with the record company. I, I'm not one for putting too much credence in what record companies say, but I certainly wanted to know what Nigel had to say. And he said that he, he came down with a certain amount of trepidation because he didn't know quite what to expect, whether he'd like it or not. And he, he said it very quickly that uh, he got into it and, and very much liked it. So, yeah, it's, it's been good. And we did an event. Uh, Kev Speakers opened up a, a brand new, I guess you, it's a store, really, in the centre of London, and managed to put the, the record company, Warner, uh, the estate, and Kef all together. And the first week of the Kef opening became a Bowie week. They ran some competition or something like that. And there were four listening sessions for the Atmos, the entire album. And the way it went, the, the first kind of session started at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it was probably more hi-fi enthusiasts than it was Bowie fans. And by the, the evening session, uh, it was more Bowie fans. And the, re the reaction was the same from all of them. They were all saying, I've never heard it that good before i'm hearing things i've never heard before uh it, it, you feel as if you're there so the, the the response that that i've got is exactly what i was looking for and it, it's it's been amazing it's been great i mean it was great having nigel come up afterwards and just say thanks you know that was that was great it was a, a really nice moment because he, he sort of made a point to take me aside at that event and just say thanks that really worked you know i didn't think it would <laughs> or something you know it's something along those lines it was like he's worried about it it was it was good. Uh, I, yeah, I played it for a few friends who are huge Bowie fans, and they've just been like, "That's right, that's right, that's what it should be." Every single one, and that's really nice. Are there any other mo um, moments you want to point out in any of the songs, or any other kind of like creative decisions that you want to talk through, or points you want to make? The only thing, like let me say, I, I didn't want it gimmicky. I didn't want things moving around too much. Uh, but there, there was one point coming towards the end, rock and roll suicide, that it just felt natural to, to have him on stage walking around a bit. And the, the ending part of it, where he, he's literally singing to the audience, sort of, he goes off as he would do. He goes off to the left and talk, sings to the audience there, goes off to the right and, and sings to them there. There was that kind of thing. And there was one other track, and I can't remember what it was, where... A number of times, I've I people have said that it had to have been two vocal takes because between verse one and verse two, 
he changes his style of singing so dramatically he couldn't possibly have done it in one take. I think he did. I can't say for sure it was 50 years ago, but I, I decided just to uh, take it for, okay, it is two different ver things and made it more like uh, two singers. So we had the first verse with one style coming sort of just off of center left. Then the second verse uh, just off of center right kind of thing. So it, 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 it emphasized more the difference between the two verses, which I quite liked. Uh, just little bits like that. I think what was one comment maybe, which I've just been thinking about now actually, was it was it was really pleasant mixing through the rendering. It was just easy. That that side of the tech is really together, and that worked. And I, we didn't really chat about this, but it just sort of we got on with it, didn't we? And that was it. It was fine. But there was a lot going on <laughs> with what we were deciding to do and how we're doing and running multiple re-renders all at the same time. We have a I have a box from Sonos, which is great at home. I re-rendered to that and hear that. And have Apple headphones, Apple Spatial running live and Binaural running live. And you know, this is great. It's like everything is, everything works and it's all just set up and straightforward. And I think we had a, the first time we were in the studio, I had to reconfigure the Dante, didn't I? And that was that evening before we started. And that was, that was like, oh, Ken sitting behind me. Oh God, I've never been in the studio with him. This is the, this is, this is not the thing to do first. <laughs> because I brought my rig in because I really want to use or have available everything that I had. And yeah. Most studio rigs don't have too much on them for very good reasons. Yeah. But yeah, that was like, oh my God, just get this right in. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it's really, I think it was very smooth, the whole thing, wasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and one of the things that blew me away was uh, the headphones. At one point, Emery said to me, why don't you check it in the headphones, see what it's like? Okay, so I went and put the headphones on. Uh, I said, okay, you hit play, and my immediate reaction was to pull the headphones off because it said, I thought he'd left the speakers on as well because I was hearing it behind me. And it, it was this was stereo headphones and i was still i thought it was behind me it was amazing it blew me away so i wanted to ask you guys both and i'm sure ken you get this question a lot but i'm i'm curious um, why do you think david bowie the the person the persona and especially the music connects emotionally with so many people over multiple generations and and on so many different levels what what was it about him and the music that that made it all so special him that's it. He was special. His, his and it, it wasn't just a, a one-off talent kind of thing. He wasn't just a good singer. He wasn't just a good songwriter. It covered a multitude of things from, uh, he was dealing with the internet way before most people were ever into all of that. He was, I, I remember Bowie Bonds coming out, which was the, the first sort of thing of, what's going on now where artists are selling the rights to all of their recorded material. But the way he set it up, he got it back after a period of time. So he got all of this money and then got the whole thing back again. It was absolutely brilliant. All, all of these, his art was amazing. And yeah, just it, it was him and his performance in the studio. I have never worked with someone quite like him. And I, I was, was talking to, uh, the engineer for the, the last, I believe it was last two albums, Kevin Killen, and uh, how it was with him during that period. And apparently it, it, the, the way it was described to me, it was exactly the same. Even though he knew he was coming to the end, it was exactly the same as it was when I worked with him at the beginning. Uh, he, he would be laughing and joking in the control room, go out, do one take, okay, that's it. And then back into the control room, it just, amazing and you know black star what an amazing way to to end things what a great record yeah just fantastic and i'd ask you kind of the same thing like what what's your take on on this amazing artist and his ability to connect with so many people the art is so real and committed you know he's just he's giving you the experience and that translates forever right it's it's that's a real superstar it's like your takes you along 
and you're you're there you know with acoustic guitar and a vocal or the whole mix i mean honestly you could turn everything off and just have the vocal and the guitar and it would still be good you know <laughs> it's it's pretty powerful performances and that's on everything and just i don't i don't know if you get anything better than that really in terms of relating to other humans and making art that people love it's it's, it's sort of perfect right so my last question for you guys is you know I'll start with you, Ken. What what excites you the most about what Dolby Atmos can offer David Bowie fans, both new and old, in terms of a listening experience and a connection to the artist? I think try, trying to make it completely immersive the way we we did, it, it's to give more of a live feel. And it, it's he toured a lot, but there are a lot of people that never saw him live, and it's it just. I, I hope that listening to it in Atmos uh, gives them at least a little sense of what he was like live and what what we got to see fairly frequently uh, in a live situation. I love the fact it's what I think is, it's very hard to say these kind of things, but I think it's a rare example of it's being modernized and it's, it's good. I'm really proud of it, you know. And that doesn't always, that doesn't always happen for so many reasons, but it's this this sort of this went better than I could have hoped, really. So I think that's a nice thing for them to listen to. I think one one of the things that that's very helpful about it and uh, goes along with with what Em said is that uh, one of one of David's things was that if he stated that anyone that's going to if there's going to be any work on his past product, it has to be the people that were involved in the first place. Thus, I get to deal with the, the albums that I did with him. Tony Visconti gets to work with the albums he did with him, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, it, it's, we would, I was there at the beginning. I know the original, what was going on in our brains at that point. So that, that holds it together. I, I know what, should be used and what shouldn't be used and all too often what happens is someone comes in that has they weren't even born when the product was made now they are making decisions that the artist never wanted that kind of thing and that that always bothers me about the the modernization of of classic records is when it's when people that weren't involved start to do things that was never intended at least with me doing it, it it's there's it, it keeps it going it, it's it's 50 years later but it, it it's kind of a straight line to the 50 years love it well we're so pleased that you did you did it with great care and integrity both of you um and the results are really fantastic i think the world's really going to enjoy and appreciate um a way of experiencing this amazing record in in dolby atmos so gentlemen thank you so much for your time thank you ben oh, great Many thanks to Ken and Emre for joining me for this truly special conversation, exploring the groundbreaking music of the late, great David Bowie. It's an honor to hear Ken share his stories of being in the studio with David and his band, working on such amazing music that is as impactful today as when it was first recorded over 50 years ago. And with Emre bringing his mixing expertise to the session, they've created a truly special immersive listening experience in Dolby Atmos. You can purchase David Bowie's The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and The Spiders from Mars mixed in Dolby Atmos by Emre and Ken on Blu-ray at davidbowie.com and rhino.com. To hear more conversations with mix and mastering engineers and producers working in Dolby Atmos, be sure you're subscribed to Dolby Creator Talks. You can find links to our show on all the major podcasting platforms, including the video version on YouTube and our show notes, or you can simply search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're curious to know more about the Dolby Institute, head over to dolbyinstitute.com. There you'll find information on all of our programming. You can subscribe to our mailing list and access the entire library of episodes in this podcast. Dolby Institute is also where you'll find the Dolby Atmos Essentials course, covering all the topics you need to get started creating content in Dolby Atmos, from studio setup through QC and delivery. The training is delivered through text, graphics, and short videos. Dolby Atmos core concepts are covered, including components of a Dolby Atmos studio, various workflows, and specific training on using the Dolby Atmos render and a range of DAWs. Post-production and Atmos music focus exercises are included along with the demo and exercise content, and it's completely free and available in five languages, so check that out. 
Professional.dolby.com is where you'll also find free trial downloads for the Dolby Atmos Renderer and Dolby Atmos Album Assembler, as well as tutorial and quick start videos, plus links to the Dolby Atmos Music Knowledge Base forum and FAQs where you can ask questions and interact with the Dolby community and support teams. A directory of enabled music studios and studio best practices is there as well. Check out our Dolby Music Community Sessions homepage and YouTube channel for our monthly deep dive sessions with mix and mastering engineers, manufacturers, and installers covering studio setup and best practices. Until next time, this is Dolby Creator Talks. I'm Ben Guyvers. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with additional editing by Matt Nixon. And our production coordinator is Karen Marroquin. Thanks for joining us.